We'll add a few years to that, but we won't tell you how many. <laughs> and Bruce, I was willing to give you three sentences. You gave me three sentences earlier. <laughs> you did. You did excellent. Trying to uh, put it in a nutshell is never easy, and I feel like I'm echoing. Are we okay out there? Do I sound okay? There we go. That's much better. Thank you for the adjustment. And uh, I do want to uh, appreciate our portion, but because it's Hanukkah, and because I'm not sure how many of you know about Hanukkah and you're celebrating, it's a little hard to celebrate what you don't know. So I want to help you understand what you're celebrating. I want you to realize you are part. Okay, here comes the H thing. It's a 2,000 year old tradition. <laughs> it didn't happen overnight. It's been happening every year since. So by you coming and plugging in and being a part, you are helping to carry on a two thousand year old tradition. We love our traditions, do we not? Let me give you quick history because I can give you I can keep you till midnight, but they told me I only have to eleven. So you know, no worries, no worries, not eleven. <laughs> but not eleven minutes either. <laughs> but let me give you just a bit of history so you can understand what's going on. And I'm I'm going to take major leaps. We're going to say it's 336 BC and Alexander the Great has conquered the world. He's got the world being united under him. He is bringing the influence of the Greeks into the area, uh, prevalent really into the world. This is the time when the Greek library expanded and people were learning Greek culture. This is the time when our scriptures were put into the Greek language, it's called the Septuagint. It was during this era. All of this is good, but the downside to all the Greek influence coming in is people began to forget their own culture and their own traditions. And in this case, I'm speaking specifically about our Jewish people. We have a group of people called the Hellenists, which were Greek speaking Jews, and they were beginning to be so influenced by the Greek culture that they were not passing down the traditions given to them by the word of God, things that, that in our scriptures that we were told we were to keep. So there's a good side, bad side to it. Taking a jump through history, we're going to land 150 years later. We're about 176 BC. By this time, we have an emperor, a ruler by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, he, let me tell you that he was from the Syrian side. I should say that after Alexander died, his empire was broken up by four generals. They each took a part. And the part that we're concerned about is the part called Israel. Israel found herself wedged between two very strong, Syria to the north, Egypt to the south. And she spent time back and forth under each control, depending on who was the stronger at the time. So now in 176 BC, Antiochus Epiphanes, he called himself that, which means God made that manifest, or God revealed. That's how egotistical he was, how arrogant he was. Our Jewish people nicknamed him Epiphanes, the mad one. And really because of his cruelty to, to human beings, to humankind, especially to the Jewish people, that name is far more fitting. He, he deified himself that he was not God. He was not anything like who our God is. Being up in Syria, wanting control, he went down through Israel into Egypt and was conquering in Egypt with the intent that he was going to make it a stronghold. Rome at this time was starting to rise. One of the Roman senators, a head Roman, came over into Egypt, met where Antiochus Epiphanes was, and told him in the name of Rome he was to stop now. He was to go back home, and if he didn't, there'd be trouble. Well, he, Antiochus being, seeing himself as God, making the rules, wasn't too kindly toward this Roman, and, and basically said, well, I'll think about it and give you an answer tomorrow to which the Roman drew a circle around him in the sand and said, if you cross this line without giving an answer first that you are going to, in essence, behave and go back home, then you will deal with all of Rome. And as Rome was rising, he knew that he would be defeated. So he went back up toward home, but he stopped in Israel. And at this point, he decided he was at least going to control this area. And this is when he put his way of, of being into effect in the land of Israel. No more Shabbat. No more circumcising your son. If you didn't circumcise your son, he was cut off from Israel according to the word of God. But no more circumcision of, of the, the sons. 
No more uh, worship on Shabbat, as I've already said. They burned all the scrolls that they could find, which is the very word of God. He put up heathen altars everywhere and demanded that the Jews bow down and worship at these altars, that they sacrifice at these altars. Knowing that the pig was the most unclean animal to the Jew, he demanded so, so that they would show that they're no longer being Jewish, that they are following the Greek ways that were being uh, forced to eat the flesh of the pig. And as Bruce said earlier, one was, was slaughtered and put on the altar in the Holy of Holies. And the, the Jesus and all spread all over the Holy Artifacts. It was a horrendous time. A few tried to fight against him. They were religious. They weren't strong. And they, they just were not managing to hold back in this tyranny. Enter Mattathias. He was one of the, like a high priest. And he was in a little city called Modi'in, just outside of Jerusalem. He was being forced one day by a Syrian uh, soldier to bow down at the altar and slaughter the pig and then to eat, and he refused. Another Jew stepped up to take his place, thinking he was doing something good, but it made Mattathias so angry. In a fit of rage, he killed both the Seleucid army person and the Jew. And then he knew he needed to flee. He fled, his sons, five of them went with him into the mountains, and there they began to form a guerrilla war band. They were the little David and his renegade army up against big Goliath, Goliath. But when you have God on your side, it doesn't matter how little you are. Whatever plus God is the victory. God saw their hearts, he saw their intent. They took the battle cry from Shemot from Exodus 15:11. That battle cry is, Micha Bocha Bali Yehovah. Who is like unto thee among the gods? Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? If you take the acronym off of those Hebrew words, you get the letters M, K, B, -E, and the Y sound. There is your name, Maccabee. That wasn't their last name. That was their battle cry. They put the banner up of the word of God. They went under the word of God, and God had favor. This little army started pushing back the Syrian army. The Syrian army at this time was the largest in the world, probably somewhere between 10,000 and 60,000. We're talking a few hundred. So you can see how outnumbered they were. But again, because of God, they were able to push the Assyrian army back, the best army, the best fed. We've got these people that have next to nothing, and yet they kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And they finally were able to push them out of Jerusalem. They knew the lay of the land because it was their land, so they were able to trap the army in mountainous areas and, and gain victory in small ways, putting it all together. They were finally winning the battle. I should have told you also, during this time, those mountain caves, many Jewish people hid in those caves. They hid scrolls in those caves. Now, if they were found with the scroll, it was immediate death. So they devised a way to make it not known what they were doing, but they, they would crowd into these caves and they would study, the, and the scrolls, by the way, are the word of God, it's our scriptures. And they would study sitting upside down and sideways, learning to read Hebrew in whatever direction because they were so hungry for the word of God. If they heard the, the army approaching, they pulled out little tops, like, um, well, we called them dreidels, but it looks like a little top. And they would spin it like they were playing a game. The Syrians would see that, thought it was a gambling game going on, and they would go on by. They put the toys away, and they pull the scrolls back out. That's why we have dreidels today in our story, but I'm getting ahead of myself because first and foremost, when they got back control of it, the area of Jerusalem, and they headed straight for the temple. They wanted to get back to worshiping God the way they knew they should, and they found it utterly destroyed. The story goes that as they were cleaning it up, they found one little cruise of oil, Kosher oil still had the, the seal of the priest on it. That would light the candle that was to be lit or the candelabra and the menorah in the temple. It would last about a day. It would take eight days to make the kosher oil, but they wanted to show God, we're, we're putting you first. We want the light that you say is always to be burning according to the Torah. And so they lit the, the uh, menorah with that oil. And as the story is told, it lasted for eight days till new oil was ready to be poured in and the light never went out. Now you're beginning to know why we celebrate with the menorah. It's called dedication in scripture because Hanukkah, meaning dedication, was the dedicating back of the temple to God. They cleansed it on the 25th of Kislev, 
they celebrated, they came into the temple with all that they were to be doing. And the victory goes on because it eventually pushed the Syrian army all the way out of Israel. They also decided at that point that they should remember this every year. And that's why from, I should have told you that uh, Antiochus was ruling at 168, and by 165 BC or 164, we're not sure which, is when the victory was won. So from that point forward, they have celebrated every year. Now, some will tell you, and it's true, that we don't read of the oil and the miracle of oil in our scriptures, that it comes in our history, in our records that are kept a little bit later telling back to the story. If that part were not accurate, then we know that they also took from the fact that they celebrate Sukkot for eight days. Sukkot was a time that we're remembering God brought them out of Egypt, out of slavery, into freedom. They are now in, out of under Syrian control, and they are in freedom. And they also saw uh, all kinds of similarities. The first and the second temple were dedicated during Sukkot. It was easy to, to say, we'll celebrate like Sukkot. Either way, we know that it was an accurate celebration of the dedication of the light in the temple. And we know that Yeshua gave his stamp of approval on that. We've already talked about that, but we'll talk a bit more about that in just a bit. Uh, again, because they want to remember, they want to retell the story, they want the children to learn the high cost of our freedom and how important it is to have that freedom for no other reason than to worship God in the way that God says they are to worship Him. So they will do everything they can to retell, lighting the menorah, one more candle each night shows the miracle getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The kids playing the dreidel game, remembering how they hid in the case setting, and they get to play for a Hanukkah gout. It's always just chocolate. <laughs> Who doesn't want chocolate? <laughs> um, so they, they uh, oh, and they sing songs back initially. Originally, they also took from Pesach, Pesach, Passover, which is eight days long also. They would recite Psalm 113 and 118. They brought that into the celebration. Now we have all kinds of songs that we sing, fun songs for the kids and, and all making it a very joyful time. Family gathers around that menorah each night, lighting the candles, singing the songs, playing for the guilt, and eating fried foods like potato latkes because they're fried in oil and it reminds them of the story. And the reason for the jelly donuts because those donuts are fried in oil so they get to tell the story and because we like to eat, so we eat. <laughs> but that's our history in a nutshell. And to, tonight what I would like to focus on with you if you've been with me in the past, you know that there's meaning for each of the nights. I'm not going to go through that this time, but yet if you did not get in on that before, I have papers that I can share with you so you can know the meaning of it. Because we're going to see a beautiful picture in the, the days of the menorah also. But I want to bring to you the significance of the light. We're all about the light. As I said, it's called this dedication in scripture, that's Chronica, but you'll also hear called the Festival of Lights. Josephus is one of the first ones to record it by such a title, and it's believed because by that point, they had decided that everyone should have lights in their home reflecting our story, hence the Hanukkah, and putting it into the homes, but they don't put it in the center of the home. They may start with it there, and today they may gather there, but it actually is supposed to be put right outside the door, or at least in the windows showing the light out for two reasons. One, we have the light and we want to share the light with the others. And the two is to show we are not afraid to declare we are Jewish and we are free because of our God. So that's what they're doing with that, but there's more significance to that light. And we can't tell half the story. We want the whole story. We want the whole, it's not kosher, but the whole enchilada, okay? So we started off tonight, we lit the Hanukkah. We said a prayer that said, blessed are you, actually we didn't do this, let me stand corrected, our Jewish people that are not yet of the, the belief of the Shia, don't know that yet, they say this prayer. We said a different one. They say, blessed are you, O Lord, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with your commandments and commanded us to light the lamp of dedication. And then they light their Hanukkah. Now, why did we not have you do the traditional prayer tonight? I'll tell you, because they're not right. 
they've got a good heart and a good intent that they took it up for our Shabbat candles, which we are declared in scripture with that, that they took it off and they just put it to fit into Hanukkah. Because I want to ask you, give me scripture and verse. And when I'm talking about our Jewish scriptures, I'm talking about the Torah and the, what follows after. The Tanakh is the original scriptures. You call them old, we call them original because they're not old, they're not antiquated. They are vibrant and the story goes on. Our Bible is one book, one story, one continuation. It is all his story. Got it? His story in relation to Israel and how he's dealing with the Jewish people who were to take it to the world. So you dear Gentiles are not left out. You're not second class citizens and you're not forgotten. God had a great plan. He had an order. In this, I will ask you, where does God command us to light the lamp of dedication? And if I picked on one of our Jewish people here who grew up in a Hager and it's Hebrew school who went every night but faithfully and learned all she was supposed to learn, if I picked them and I said, give me the scripture, I want to hear an answer. And she knows who I'm talking about. <laughs> That's because there isn't an answer, is there, Janet? <laughs> I wasn't going to be answer, but I already did, so forgive me. <laughs> it's not in the scripture. We're not commanded to light the lamp of dedication. That's why I didn't have us do that prayer tonight, why our prayer talked about our holy days being a glory unto our God. And we see that it's Yeshua who is the light of the world. But let me tell you a, a bit more, because now we've got a real problem. We've got, oh, and by the way, I didn't tell you they love to exchange gifts and all of that also, and everybody from that thinks, oh, Hanukkah is a Jewish Christmas. Like, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay? Because I only have a short time tonight, let me just say no. Don't ever say that. Don't go there. It's not. Okay? It has nothing to do with that. The greatest gift, yes, we recognize that it came into this world. It's the light coming into the world. Whether it was on December 25th or on March 25th or on another day, I don't personally care. The fact is it came. Don't miss that and don't miss celebrating that because I, we embrace that fully. But again, this isn't a Jewish Christmas. This isn't a commandment. It doesn't even come with all of our seven major feasts that we get mainly in the book of Viagra, Leviticus, in scripture. It's not there. Well, how could it be there when I just gave you the history and the history is 165 BC and those scriptures were written like 3000 BC. Obviously it's not there. So I'm going to ask you, a very important question. See, we Jewish people, we love questions. We love to answer questions, flip a question. So be prepared because I'll give you more questions. Do we have a problem? We're here celebrating tonight. Maybe we shouldn't be celebrating. Maybe, maybe Hanukkah shouldn't be as important to us as we make it to be. Hmm. You know, our problem is further exasperated. Because we have wonderful people around us. These people love us, but they misunderstand us. There are evangelical brothers, and they say to us, why do you need to do all your Jewish stuff? <laughs> well, hello. That's who we are. That's our culture. That's our connection with our God. That's our promises. That's our scripture. And did you know that's the roots of what we believe? Did you know that everything that you get in the Brita Chalashah in the New Covenant has its basis in the original, in the Tanakh. Do you know that if you take part off, that's like going to high school, but never going to kindergarten through junior high and trying to understand a foreign language. You've got to see it's completed. It's a continuation from Bereshit to Revelation. It's all about the shot. And it's there. It's there in all of our holy days. Every single one points to Yeshua. Is Hanukkah any different? Hmm. Well, let's look at the scriptures to answer our questions because it doesn't matter what Rochelle says. When you go home tonight, anything Rochelle said is going to be forgotten and it's not of any value. But if God said it, take it to heart, take it into your life, embrace it, and act on it because we're supposed to be hearers of the word and doers. So there's your challenge. Let's look at the line in scripture. Obviously, 
there is a true light, a light which the God of Israel wants us to know. He put a light in our temple. He said it's to represent him, it's to be continuous, it's to never stop because God never stops. And he is always in relation to his people. They may not be in right relation with him, but I ask you as a parent, when your child is rebellious and your child training, have you whipping their parent or are you even all the more their parent? You're all the more and you're tugging at them to come back. That's where sometimes God is with Israel, tugging at her to come back, but never, never leaving her, never forsaking her. And there would not be an Israel today if that were not that, because it, it just, if you know Israel history, it wouldn't happen. It wouldn't be a lot without God and God on their side, like little David. So what do we see about the light in scripture? We go to one of our prophets because uh, we have many, many scriptures on light. But we're going to go to the prophet Yeshiyahu, Isaiah, and we're going to see that God foretold through him that the people would be in darkness. I like that. God says, you know what? I knew it ahead. I knew you were going to blow it. I knew you were going to be in trouble. I knew that you were going to be in darkness. I knew you needed the light. So I went ahead of you, and I made an answer for you. God's always got it. Nothing surprises him. He never comes up with plan B. And he never has his first original plan foiled. He can't do it to God. So he told them in Isaiah's time, he told them, you made a confederacy with another king. Hello, I'm your God. You don't need another king. You need me. But because they went their own way and they rebelled against God, he said in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And if you're in a complete church Bible, start at the end of chapter 8 and go into chapter 9. But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he will make it glorious. By the way of the sea, on the other side of the Jordan, that's the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, or Galilee of the Goi. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Oh, that's a wonderful promise. Our Jewish people have sinned, they have been in error, and because of that, there was darkness over the land. About 700 years after Yeshayu, Isaiah prophesied this, the people were walking in darkness. I'm bringing you into the first era of what is called the Christian era, the first era that would go from BC, which is before Christ, whether they like it or not, and we're moving into AD, into the year of our Lord. We see darkness throughout the land of Israel. We see darkness throughout the world. We see that the people are in great darkness. Well, did the people at that time see a great light then? Because God said you'd be in darkness when there'd be a great light. So are we still looking for that or did something happen? Well, if we look in our original scriptures, we don't get the answer. But remember, I told you, it's a continuation. It's a story that goes on. For any Jewish people out there, if you've never taken a peek at the Brech HaRashah, look at the first verse, look at the first couple of verses, and you're going to find our Jewish genealogy right there. It doesn't get more Jewish than that. So knowing now that this continues on, we can take a peek into the Brech HaRashah, which recorded during that first century what was happening. And we can see if there was a time that a light came on the people. And we look no further than the very first book in the Brech HaRashah, written by Jewish Narabayu, Matthew chapter 4, verses 13 to 16, and I'll quote it for you. But he left Nazareth. He came to live in Kafarnecha, a lakeshore town near the boundary between, and here it, Zebulon and Naphtali. And my radar is going up. Mm, that's what I say. I talked about that area right there. This happened, verse 14, in order to fulfill what Yeshayahu the prophet had said. Matthew, in the Bread of Chodeshon, you're quoting my prophet Isaiah, and you're saying this is what he was talking about. That's plain. I get it. I can understand that. So here we go. Let's see what happened because he said that Isaiah said, 
the land of Zebulon, the land of Naphtali, toward the lake, beyond the Yorin, filled all of the Goyim. Isn't that exactly what I just read? The people, those people who were sitting in darkness as it's thrown down, now Matthew's recording the next words, jump off the page. They saw a great light. That's where it changes. When I read it in Mishaya, it said they will see. Matthew says they saw. What happened? What's Matthew recording? The light came. That light that came, it says, those who were sitting in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light dawn. Wow, I'm getting excited because this is fulfilling. This is showing me the answer. And when I know light ties in a chronic, I'm going to get my answer whether we're on the right track tonight or whether we're in a world of hurt. They saw a great light. Continuing on in from our original scriptures, we go through in the first books in that word of Hadashah, we have the record of Yeshua walking on the sun. And it says that Yeshua the Nazareth, Jesus the Nazarene, walked the shores of Hillel. He walked in that area that we're talking about. Hmm. Could that have something to do with the light? Let's keep looking. Back in Yeshayahu and Isaiah, in his prophecy, in chapter 60 this time, verses 1 and 2, prophetically speaking, but looking for it as if it happened, he said, Arise, shine, Jerusalem, for your light has come. Okay, so Galilee and Jerusalem, you're both involved in this light. Your light has come. The glory of Adonai has risen on you, for all the darkness covers the earth. Thick darkness of peoples on you, Adonai, will rise. Over you will be seen his glory. Those people then are the people who sat in darkness who would see their great, this great light. Well, what happened at Yeshua's time? Did everybody see a great light? Yes, there were those who came to believe and follow Yeshua. There were those who did not, but among those who did were authorities. There were multitudes. There were many who became his family. They followed him. They found value in who he was and what he said. So could Yeshua have something to do with this? Because he's walking in that right area and people are catching on to something. What are they hearing him say? Well, let's read a little bit more in the Brit Chadashah and see what Yeshua said. Another very Jewish author by the name of Yochanan John wrote down for us what Yeshua said. And I love the fact that we have more than one witness. If I took this into a court, I've got so many witnesses. How many witnesses, eyewitnesses, do you need to say, there's the truth? Well, we've got the Isaiah portion. Now we've got Matthew saying it's being fulfilled. And here comes Yochanan John. And he says something that shocks screams the answer. He said, Yeshua spoke to them, and he said, and this is chapter 8 and verse 12, for those who want to read it on their own later. Yeshua speaking, I am, oh, that's Jewish. I am goes all the way back to the early bush. And then he goes on, he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light, which gives light. Wow, could that be the light? The light that came on our people that were in darkness, they saw a great light and it brought them light, it brought them life. If so, then that light is all about Yeshua because he said, I am the light. Not only did he claim to be the light, but then he took us to Hanukkah. Many of you may not know this, but Hanukkah is in the Brit Hadashah. Is in that part of the scriptures. Yochanan, John, is the one who recorded it. And I think Bruce read it for you earlier, but not everyone was there. And I'm glad because I want to read it. <laughs> John 10, 22 and 23 says, at that time, the feast of the dedication, we now know that means Hanukkah. At that time, Hanukkah took place in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, and it was winter, December it fits. And Yeshua Jesus was walking, in your English it will say, in the temple area, in the portico of Solomon. Now, if you don't have a good Jewish background, that means nothing. <laughs> but for those of us who are Jewish, he, our Jewish scriptures even say he was walking around in the temple area in Shomo's colonnade. You know what happened in the colonnade? It wasn't where they made the sacrifices. 
It was where they got to gather for the celebrations. It was the area where they could celebrate what God is doing. It's the area where they put up at Hanukkah time a 75 foot menorah. The temple's already up on a, a mountain platform, and now a 75 foot tall menorah lit. What do you think all of Jerusalem saw? They saw great light. And it's very likely at that time, Yeshua said, and maybe even pointed, I am the light of the world. Wow, I think we're getting it. I think we're putting together a puzzle that is coming into very clear focus. And yet, I want to keep it not with a me reading hand, but with what, what's recorded for us. And the next verse absolutely jumps out. Many stop with 22 and 23, and they miss 24. The people at that time, the Jews, it starts and it says, so the Jews and the Judeans, surrounded him. They surrounded Yeshua. They had a question for him. I love it. We love our questions. They asked, how much longer are you going to keep us in suspense? And I could say, how much longer are you going to keep us in the dark? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. They're beginning to get it. It's connecting. It's not the Messiah they expect who's knocking out Rome and who's coming as king in all his glory, which he will do as promised in the future. But this one was getting different. And that's why they had questions. But they were seeing the things he was doing and the things he was saying all pointed to Messiah. And if he's claiming to be this light of the world, they're getting it. They're putting it together. And you know what Yeshua's answer to them was? If you don't, you need to read the chapter. I'll give you a hint, though, because I don't want to leave you in the dark tonight. He told them very plainly. He said, I've already told you. The works that I do, they are done in my Father's name. They testify of me. He's saying, I've shown you that you're not believing it. And sadly, many of our Jewish people want to deny this today, and they miss the light because they're not willing to look at the truth. But he showed it by what he did. Nicodemus, as you call him, Nachthamon, Thamon, sorry, I said his name wrong, but you get it. He came to Yeshua, and he said, only one who comes from God can do what you do. I, I need to understand this. So we see they were catching on. They were getting it. And then if there was any doubt, Yeshua nailed it shut because in verse 30 of chapter 10 of Yotanon, he declared, I am the Father of God. Wow. This is the one sent from God. This is the one who is the Son of God, who was promised by Yeshua, Isaiah, in chapter 7 and verse 14, chapter 9 and verse 6. These verses that you'll hear many times, one telling you that a virgin would conceive, another telling you who he was and that the government will rest on his shoulders, and we will see that in his second coming. But out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. Yeshua not only declared, I am the light of the world, but he declared, I'm the light that will give you life. Could you say that to someone else? Could you say, I can give you life, I can give you light that gives you life? Only God can give life. God is the life giver and the life breather. And all Yeshua was doing was finishing off the sentence that Yochanan and John began. Because in chapter 1, in verses 4 and 5 and 9, Yochanan and John said, In him, in Yeshua, in this one who said, I am the life, in him was life, and life was the light of mankind. And the light shines in the darkness. The darkness didn't grasp it. Not everyone understood this. But verse 9 says, this was the true light that coming into the world enlightens every person. Who else could declare this? He is either who he says he is or he should be banished and never thought of again. But he proved over and over he is the one who came from God. He literally is God with skin on. He came in human flesh. And when he came, 
those who came into believing the darkness was dispelled the light came in they were flooded with light and those who, who realized who were enlightened and illuminated they caught on and they followed him and we have them from all walks of life it wasn't just one little sect of one little area that we see peasants and we see potentates we see amateurs and we see artisans we see poor and we see wealthy we see sick people and we see those who are well we see the illiterate and the well educated all coming to believe prisoner and free man the same and i'll bring it right down and nail it for us tonight jew and gentile both there were those who saw who believed who moved who came into the light and became one in Yeshua, the light of the world. That's fulfilling scripture. They're fulfilling prophecy. Let's go back to Yeshua again. Let's go to chapter 60, verse 3, and it says, Nations will come to your light. And he's speaking to Israel. Israel, you're going to have the light. You're going to shine the light to the nations. This is what they were to do originally. This is what they will do when they finally get back on track right with God, they will fulfill it completely, but we get a foretaste, we get a shadow. And not only did Yeshua celebrate Hanukkah, declare it that he is the light of it, give his stamp of approval on it, but at the same time he is saying, I am the one. I'm the one who coexisted with God, I am co-equal with God, I am co-eternal, I am the one who came from eternity past and who will go into eternity future. And I look at our menorah, and I forgot to bring one in, but remember our menorah. Remember how one stood a little higher than all the others? That one is called the shamash. We lit all the others with the shamash candle. Shamash means servant. The son of God, who took on human form, did it to come down as a servant. He stooped down from heaven to bring the light into us on the earth. And this is a perfect picture, but thank you so much. You can see how it's yes, high and lifted up. And we see in this, he bent down from heaven to light in our hearts the truth. He is lifted up because the one who came lowly, suffered as a servant, gave his life, shed his blood on the execution state, for the forgiveness of sin, perfect sinless blood in our place is the one who will be lifted up. We know that from Moshe lifting up the, the uh, serpent in the wilderness, the people who looked up to the one lifted up were healed. The people who look up to the one who is, the one who came from above, who is lifted up, will find the light. They will be dazzled. They will be in the brilliance of the light. They will be the people who sat in darkness now seeing the light. Should we celebrate Hanukkah? Oh, yes. Does it teach us about Yeshua the same as all our seven major feasts? Yes. Is it a beautiful picture of our Messiah? Yes. The Son of Man, Matthew 20, 28, he came not to serve, I'm sorry, not to be served, but to serve, to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew tells it to us. John says, if I'm lifted up, I will draw all unto me. He was lifted up. My closing verse for you is to tell you, there's coming a day when there will be a repeat in history. And Titus Epiphanes is a type of one called the Antichrist. He will come against Israel with all the vendetta to destroy Israel that Antiochus Epiphanes did too. The people will be suffering greatly. Malchi declared that. He said, behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. You may be in darkness yourself, you need to come into the light because if you're not in the light that darkness will envelop you and take you to a place you don't want to go if you have the light within show it put it in the window put it in the doorway send it out it is electrifying it is enlightening i'll tell you plug into the light of the world you'll know no power failure that's our light of hunger
like I say in the back, if I'm short and she's short, all I can see was the back seat. <laughs> okay, I hope I can do justice, Roger. Yaakov's a good one. Are you ready for us? Yes. Yeah. It's very important the whole time. Yes. <laughs> so you want him to do the prayer, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's true. I got her. Yeah, I got her. We're good. Yeah. Okay. Baruch Atah Adonai, the Hainu Melech Olam, Asher Shana. Start over. Okay. Start again. Yeah. Baruch Atah Adonai, the Hainu Melech Olam, Asher Kishana, Vedam Yeshua Hamashiach, Bitzvenu Lashemah Kol Shifar. That's what I you are, God, King of the Universe. Sanctified as the blood of Yeshua Hamashiach, instructions to the call of the Shofar. Amen.